I'm going to do a presentation on how to avoid pitfalls in Terraform. So uh, a little bit about me. So I'm a customer reliability engineer at Rackspace. I help customers run workloads reliably on Google Cloud and Kubernetes. I'm also an open source contributor to several projects, such as the Google Cloud Terraform provider, Packer, and Knative. OK, so we're going to talk about three topics. So insecure authentication methods, so working with tricky resources and API objects, how to get help, and request features. OK, so authenticating Terraform. So on every cloud vendor, they have this nice website that says, here's the best way to authenticate, right? So they'll often give you a list of options. So this here is the options for Google Cloud, right? So as you know, when you're using Google Cloud, you get access to a couple of authentication methods. One of them is service account keys. There's also the second option, which is really helpful if you are an end user that's running Terraform on your computer. Uh, and if you're running Terraform on, on Google Cloud, or on VMs or Kubernetes, you get access to the metadata server, right? So Terraform will respect this list of authentication if you don't specify anything in the provider block, right? However, providers also allow you to explicitly specify credentials, which isn't really recommended in ex extremely limited circumstances. So I've got a couple of examples here. So these are a couple of examples. We see a lot of these in tutorials, and these are really bad. Um, so the first one there is a, an example for someone trying to use AWS provider. A lot of tutorials, when you see them, they say, oh, make an IAM user, grab the access key and the secret key, put it in there like this, and then people end up committing this, right? So which causes problems. The second one there is, is a more pertinent example for Google Cloud, which a lot of new people do, which is a big, big pitfall. I'm going to see why it's a problem in a second. So those two examples earlier are a problem for three key reasons, right? So number one, there's a good chance that you could end up leaking credentials. That actually happened somewhere recently that I was investigating. Um, which was very messy and incurred a lot of costs. Uh, the other problem is hard-coded credentials take precedence over cred credentials loaded from the environment, so which causes problems when you're doing CI CD, right? So if you've got something like this in CI CD, you can't really use environment variables that are loaded from this VM that's running on or some other mechanisms, right? So here's a better example. So if you look here, I grab number one, temporary credentials, number two, these are credentials that are loaded from the environment, right? So this is an AWS example. If you look at the provider block, it's empty. There's nothing there. So Terraform will automatically pick up these credentials. And by the way, these are expired, so they're not valid. But yeah. So TLDR uh, for this bit, temporary credentials, um, leave the provider block empty. Um, the other thing is a lot of providers, um, especially, sorry, in Google Cloud and some of the other cloud vendors as well, they allow you to use OIDC to log in. So you might have noticed that CI systems like GitHub and GitLab as well, they allow you to use CI, they allow you to use OIDC login so you don't have to take hard-coded credentials there. So the other topic we're looking at is complex and tricky API objects. So quick explainer there. So as you know, Terraform implements an API. If there isn't an API, then this can't be managed through Terraform, right? So for simplification, we'll assume we're talking about a REST API that has this standard method, so create, read, update, and delete. So here's a simple resource in Google Cloud, right? So the good old storage bucket is a very simple API. It's also a synchronous API, so there's no operation. So when you run Terraform apply, it will execute right away, and it's done, right? You don't wait a few minutes while things happen. Um, this is what it looks like in the documentation. Uh, I'm going to talk about the documentation later, but I just want to draw your attention to something on the left, which is the methods on the subject. And then the bit in the middle is about all the fields available and what they mean and the valid values that are available. Um, here is a slightly more tricky resource, right? So SSL certificates on Google Cloud is a little bit annoying. Um, so first problem that you'll see is it has no update method, so life gets a little bit tricky if you don't do it properly. Uh, the other problem that you often run into is some of the fields won't be sent back to you by Google because there are sensitive fields, such as the key. Uh, oh, yeah, and this is the resource documentation for that particular resource. Um, same, uh, the methods are on the right as well, as well as the left, but I've collapsed the left. Okay, so. 
which one is easier to work with? So the picture on the left is, sorry, let's start with the picture on the right. So on the right is what a lot of people do, right? So, and that's problematic for a number of reasons. Um, whereas the configuration on the left, I hope I'm saying, I'm talking, this is the better one? That's the better one, just to clarify. Um, so the configuration, the better config has a few features why it's good. So number one, it's using something called name prefix. This is a field that's very common in the Google Cloud Terraform provider. We use it a lot with um, resources that don't allow you to update them, right? So it saves you a lot of headache. The other key thing is the lifecycle block. Um, you need to have that. Otherwise, what will happen is if you were to deploy what was on the right and you wanted to change the certificate because it expired or whatever, Next time you run that, that's going to fail because Google will complain it already exists. Why are trying to create something that already exists? So a lot of people, what they often do is they'll change the resource ID of the resource, which doesn't really help them. Um, the other thing is the order of execution is kind of important because you want Terraform to run this in the right order, which is that second bullet point there. You want Terraform to create the new certificate, then go and apply that new certificate on the load balancer, then take the old certificate off and then delete it, right? Because if you don't execute in that order, you will get errors, right? So if you're running since CICD, you get a lot of failed jobs, which now requires a human to go in and fix a lot of things, right? The other thing I want to call out is please get in the habit of reading API documentation. I know a lot of people don't, and it's kind of helpful that they did. Uh, I also want to look at this section here about getting help and requesting features. So. OK, so these, these are the three things. Um, so I'm going to start with the first one, which is asking the right things at the right place. Um, as a contributor to the Google Cloud Terraform provider, I see this a lot, right? So someone will come, they'll open an issue, and the first time we look at it, we'll be like, hey, you didn't read the documentation, or this is not the right question here. So these are a couple examples, right? So what we see a lot is people will go to the HashiCorp Terraform re repository, and then they'll complain about a missing feature in a provider, right? And the first thing that'll happen is the Terraform core maintainers will be like, hey, sorry, wrong place. They'll throw your issue over to the right repo, right? So that's an extra delay in getting help before you actually get it. Um, the other thing is we get a lot of issues where people are saying, hey, the API is doing X. I think you should be doing Y. Uh, and that's not the right question to ask in the GitHub repositories for HashiCorp because we're not responsible for that, right? So you need to go and talk to the cloud vendor and request a feature change or follow their processes for making API changes. Uh, the other thing we see as well is somebody will complain and say, hey, there's a bug in the API. Um, your best course of help for that is to log a spoke into the cloud vendor. They will look at it. If it's a real bug, they'll get it fixed. And hopefully, you shouldn't have anything, you shouldn't need anything else from the Terraform provider teams. Uh, the cloud provider documentation is super important. Um, for Google Cloud in particular, on every resource at the top, we've got a link to the exact API documentation for the particular resource that's being used. The other thing is the documentations in registry.terraform.io is out of date sometimes because the cloud vendor will update the API field descriptions. So for the latest set of acceptable values and whatnot, you'll find it there. Um, and as always, Terraform implements an API, so if you want to get better at it, please read the API documentation. So this is what documentation looks like for Google Cloud. And this is the um, Terraform documentation for the providers. I'm going to call out a few things. So number one at the top there, there is version. So every provider documentation is version nowadays. Uh, this is a new feature that came out last year, which is really helpful. So make sure you're looking at the documentation for the version of the provider that you're using. Uh, the other thing I want to call out is look at these yellow boxes at the top of the resources, super important. A lot of frequently complained about issues often end up there, right? So when we see two or three complaints about something, we often put it there and say, hey, please look at these warnings. So for this particular resource, there's a couple of gotchas that you got to watch out for. Uh, there's two there. Um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, the last thing I'm going to mention is reporting bugs, right? So I'm going to repeat again, ask at the right place for the right team, right? So bug reports is another thing that we get a lot, right? So people will use Terraform. It doesn't quite work the way they thought it was going to work. 
And we get a lot of bug reports where there is not enough information to investigate. So they're missing stuff. So if you raise bug reports, please provide the Terraform version, the provider version. If you're not using the latest provider, please go ahead and do that first. There's a good chance that the bug might have been fixed somewhere between your current version and the latest version, uh, but not always. Oh, debug logs, super important. Um, the last thing I'll mention is please make sure you give a small snippet of code that can reproduce the bug, right? So the easier it is for the person that's going to fix your bug to fix the problem, give them as much information as they can, and then they'll get to fixing that bug right away. If you don't provide this information, the first thing they'll say to you is, go oh, and please send me the provider version or give me all this information. And then they'll get back to you next week or whenever they get back to you. And now you're spending time before you get the help that you actually wanted. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you.